Okay. So it's a pleasure to have uh, the first speaker this afternoon is Victoria Hoskins. And I'll let you. Yeah, so, uh, oh, sorry, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, sorry, I just should take a couple of seconds. Okay, so um, uh, today I'm going to talk about how to construct some new moduli spaces uh, via non-reductive geometric invariant theory. And so this is going to be one of three talks uh, this afternoon. So the theme of this afternoon is uh, non-reductive GIT. So I'm planning to just gently introduce everyone. So I'm quite happy to have the uh, opportunity to speak here and tell you a little bit about non-reductive GIT and in particular, new moduli spaces that you can construct using it. And this is going to be based on joint work, which is actually in progress with uh, Greg Berksy, Josh Jackson, and Francis Cohen. Okay, so uh, let's begin. So as an overview, oh, sorry. Uh, many moduli spaces are constructed via reductive GIT, and they inherit notions of stability from GIT. Um, so the classic example uh, is the moduli space of semi-stable vector bundles on a smooth projective curve. Um, and uh, there's kind of two roles of reductive GIT. So firstly, it removes certain unstable orbits, and then also it identifies certain S-equivalent orbits to get a reasonably behaved quotient. Uh, and I'm going to recap a little bit about reductive GIT during the talk. But um, you could ask, well, what, what about unstable objects? What, what happens to those? And so you could ask, should there be a moduli space of vector bundles of fixed hard and Siemens type? And if so, how is that constructed? And what about moduli problems which are naturally non-reductive? So for example, if you look at moduli spaces of hypersurfaces in weighted projective spaces, then um, this is naturally um, a non-reductive setup because the automorphism groups of weighted projective spaces are non-reductive. And in fact, so in today's talk, I'm going to explain that both of these can be constructed via non-reductive GIT. So let me start with a quick summary of, of uh, Mumford's reductive GIT. So um, the whole theory basically is built on uh, the affine GIT quotient. So if you've got G, a reductive group acting on an affine variety, then it acts on uh, the uh, coordinate ring of X. And by taking the ring of invariance, you get a good quotient. And the key point here is that because G is reductive, the ring of invariance is finitely generated. And so indeed you can take spec of that ring of invariance. And so this is the local model for all GIT quotients. So um, uh, now let's move to the projective GIT setting. Um, so if you've got G a reductive group now acting on a projective variety, then the basic idea is that you want to construct a quotient by gluing affine GIT quotients of G invariant open subsets. And how do you construct these G invariant open subsets? Well, uh, using a linearization of the action, which you can think of as a um, G equivariant line bundle on X, but perhaps it's better to think of that as giving you an equivariant embedding into some projective space. So, then basically the whole theory is going to depend on this, uh, this choice. So the linearization here is actually a choice that you make. Um, so you look at the ring of invariance um, uh, of uh, sections of L and, and all its powers. And this is again finitely generated. And now you take proj of this. And in this case, you only get a, a rational map here um, because obviously there might be some points for which there's no invariant section, which doesn't vanish at that point. It, it, uh, yes. And so the, um, this rational map is defined precisely on what's called then the semi-stable set here, um, which is the locus of points for which there is an invariant section, which is non-vanishing at that point. And uh, you get a good quotient of this semi-stable set and it restricts uh, to a geometric quotient, i.e. an orbit space on the so-called stable locus. And both these um, semi-stable and stable sets depend on the choice of linearization. And a, a, a great feature is that actually you end up with a, a quotient, which is a projective variety. And that's very nice if you're wanting to construct moduli spaces because then you get something compact. 
And the ideal situation is when semi-stability coincides with stability, in which case uh, you actually get an orbit space, which is compact. And uh, if that's not the case, then there's a process called the uh, Cohen desingularization, which um, is basically a sequence of equivariant blow-ups such that on the, on the blown up variety, you have that semi-stability coincides with stability. And here the basic idea is that you just want to blow up the locus of points which are semi-stable and have uh, positive dimensional uh, stabilizers. For, for key one desingularization, you need the, the smoothness of X? You don't need the smoothness of X, um, but if X is smooth, uh, then X tilde will be smooth. And so uh, it, it's nicest when X is smooth. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so and another, another really important feature of um, reductive GIT is that we don't actually have to calculate these invariant rings to work out what the semi-stable locus is because there's the hilbert mumford criterion for semi-stability, which says that a point is semi-stable if and only if it's semi-stable for all one-parameter subgroups um, in G. And uh, that kind of has a very combinatorial interpretation as saying that, um, so remember that our linearization determines for us some embedding, uh, G equivariant embedding into some projective space. And then we can look at the GM weights on that projective, on that uh, uh, vector space V, and we get a bunch of weights for our point. And we ask that uh, the origin is in the convex hull of those GM weights. Okay, so um, what about, so a lot of this talk is going to be about what happens outside the semi-stable locus. And uh, that's what's called instability stratifications. So, um, uh, and these, um, so these are due to work of Hesselink, Kempf, Cohen, and Ness. So um, the basic idea is that if you have a, a linearized G action, where again, G is still a reductive group and uh, X is a projective variety, and you also fix an invariant norm on the Lie algebra of G, then there's an associated stratification of X, um, which uh, is denoted like this into finitely many G invariant locally closed strata. Um, these, are, these are what we call the unstable strata, um, at least if beta is non-zero. So um, such that the open stratum here is the semi-stable locus. And that depends on obviously on our linearization. And the higher strata um, are somehow unstable strata. And this is a stratification in a weak sense that we have that the closure of one stratum is contained in the union of all higher strata. So it's not actually an inequality here. Okay. And so, so there's two different ways in which we can construct this stratification. So one is completely algebraic and that's to use the Hilbert Mumford criterion. And this was the approach used by, well, first Kempf and then Hesselink. And so here, what you do is you associate to an unstable point, a one parameter subgroup that is most, most responsible for the instability of this point. So here, most responsible, is uh, measured using the invariant norm that we choose. And so as you change that norm, you're going to get uh, different uh, answers as to what is most responsible. And um, so if you're over the complex numbers, which most of the time is, is what we're interested in, then uh, there's actually an a symplectic construction which uses the norm square of the moment map. So if you choose a maximal compact subgroup K, so then G is the complexification of K, and uh, then uh, take a moment map associated to this action where here, again, you use the linearization to embed X in some projective space and use the Fabini studi form there. Then uh, again, using the norm, we get uh, the norm squared of the moment map now going from X to R and we can view this as a Morse function and then use this to stratify X. And actually uh, by work of Francis Cowan and Linda Ness, these two are the same. So um, these, these, these stratifications are actually very useful. So um, one of the main applications that uh, Francis Cohen was interested in in her thesis was to study the cohomology of GIT quotients. And so I'm, I'm maybe not going to say too much about this because um, Eloise is going to be speaking next. And I think she's going to explain a lot about how you can compute Betty numbers 
of uh, GIT quotients uh, using these stratifications. So um, we won't say too much about that. And also the second application is um, to study variation of GIT quotients. So what happens as you vary the linearization out? And uh, so there's actually quite a lot of work on this. I mean, uh, I didn't write down an exhaustive list of uh, people, but uh, originally this was constructed, well, the sort of birational point of view was uh, studied by Dolgachev, Hugh and Sadeus, but then recently there's been several papers studying this on the level of derived categories. So it's going to be important for the rest of the talk that we describe the strata. And so um, I, I'll, I'll uh, take you through how we can describe the strata. So the, the beta that we have corresponding the, the index actually determines for us a conjugacy class of um, rational one parameter subgroups. And so if you pick some representative, then there's a parabolic subgroup associated to this one parameter subgroup. And uh, this has a unipotent factor, um, which is obviously non-reductive, and a levy factor, which is reductive. And using this, uh, this group, we're going to um, construct uh, the strata. So uh, what do we do? Firstly, we look at the fixed locus for the one prime subgroup uh, lambda beta acting on X. And uh, then inside there, we take the locus of fixed points uh, on which uh, lambda beta acts on the fiber of our linearization with a particular weight. And the weight is minus beta squared. So this is um, some particular weight space in the fixed locus. And then we look at all points. Um, so then we define Y beta to be the locus of all points which flow to Z beta under our one parameter subgroup. And so then we have a natural retraction um, going from uh, Y beta to Z beta. So this I'm called P beta, um, which is um, U beta, in, oh, sorry, yes. U beta invariant and equivariant with respect to the natural retraction that goes from uh, the parabolic group P beta to L beta. So um, that's, that's part of it, um, but then actually we actually need to take open subsets inside here. And so we take um, the so-called semi-stable locus in Z beta, which is the semi-stable locus for the reductive levy factor acting with respect to a twisted linearization. So um, this twisted linearization, what we do is we take our original linearization, which we know all the points were unstable for, and we shift by a character. And this character here is basically canceling the effect of lambda beta, which should be thought of as the one parameter subgroup that's most responsible for these points being unstable. And so this effect of shifting should sort of cancel that in a sense. And then um, in Y beta, we've just let Y beta SS be the pre-image of Z beta SS. And so morally, uh, Y beta SS is the locus of points for which the one parameter subgroup lambda beta is most responsible for the instability of these points. And again, most responsible here is measured using this norm uh, and the instability is measured using the linearization L. And so you get uh, the following description of the strata. So it turns out that the Y beta SS are only invariant under the action of the parabolic group. And since we want a, um, a G invariant stratum, we sort of sweep out by the G action. And that, that basically corresponds to choosing different uh, representatives of uh, lambda beta. So remember, we picked a representative lambda beta of this conjugacy class. Okay, so let me um, try and explain this pictorially using torus weights. So if you fix a maximal torus in G, then your norm allows you to identify uh, co-characters and characters. So here you have your one parameter subgroup. So I assume that I've chosen a maximal torus containing um, my particular representative that I've uh, chosen. And then on the character side, you have all of the T weights of the linearized action. And you can draw these on the same picture now. So um, I do that in this picture on the left here. Um, so you have um, the array through the one parameter subgroup lambda beta, and that's in blue here. And then you have the T weights, which are in orange. 
And Z beta is the locus of points such that all of the T weights lie on, oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, lie on the hyperplane H beta through beta. And then Y beta is the locus of points where all of the T weights lie this side of the hyperplane and there's one actually lying on the hyperplane. And then uh, Y beta semi-stable is, um, can be thought of as points where beta is the closest point to the origin in the convex hull of the T weights. Okay, so that's um, a quick introduction to these uh, instability stratifications. And uh, so then you can ask, um, how can we construct quotients of these unstable strata? And in fact, it's quite simple to construct categorical quotients of the unstable strata, but unfortunately they're not very good. So um, we have the following proposition. A categorical quotient of the G action on S beta is equivalent to a categorical quotient of the parabolic subgroup P beta acting on Y beta SS. So this just follows from the isomorphism that we have here. Um, and uh, the second point is that um, a categorical quotient of the P beta action is given by, first you take this retraction uh, to Z beta SS, which is just flowing under your one parameter subgroup lambda beta. And then you take the reductive GIT quotient of the Levy factor acting on Z beta. And this is a categorical quotient of the P beta action on Y beta SS. So um, let me just briefly outline the proof. So um, firstly, um, it's clear that the composition is P beta invariant. So we just need to check its universal property. So suppose there exists an F, which is a P beta invariant map to some other variety B. Then we need to show that this factors via um, this GIT quotient here. So firstly, we can restrict F to uh, Z beta SS. And uh, this is now L beta invariant and this triangle here commutes because F is constant on orbit closures and the map P beta is just um, sending a point to a point in its orbit closure. And therefore, if we now look at the right triangle, then uh, we can now use the universal property of pi, which says that then there must be a unique factorization um, uh, of the map F restricted to Z beta SS through the GIT quotient, and this gives um, the universal property of the categorical quotient of P beta acting on Y beta SS. So this looks relatively simple, but it's actually not a very good answer to our problem because it's very far from being an orbit space. So what, what I mean by this is that um, the first thing we did was we took a point in Y beta SS and we sent it to a, its flow under the one parameter subgroup lambda beta. So in general, this is not going to be in the same orbit as uh, the point that we started with. And so already we've identified a point with something that's, well, an orbit with something that's not in, its, in, in the same orbit. Uh, and in fact, exactly this locus um, Z beta SS is the problem. So, um, the goal uh, of today's talk is to try and find a geometric uh, quotient of the parabolic group acting on an open set of Y beta SS. And in fact, we really want to take an open set of Y beta SS because we want to remove this locus Z beta SS to avoid these kind of identifications. And let me say why we've now switched to looking at the parabolic group action rather than the reductive group action G, because remember we could have either considered the reductive group action or the parabolic group action. Well, the, the main advantage here is that there are more characters that we can use to twist the linearization. So a parabolic group has many more characters than uh, the reductive group itself. And this leads to different notions of stability. And so in fact, um, we're actually going to see that rather conveniently, the non-reductive GIT notion of stability is precisely going to remove the locus Z beta SS. And so this is incredibly helpful for us. Okay, so um, before moving on to non-reductive GIT, I wanted to sort of um, 
explain these stratifications in a nice example, which I think fits the title of this conference a little bit. Um, and that's to talk about instability stratifications and vector bundles. And so since uh, the audience is more case stability, I thought it's, it's, it's best to explain the motivation coming from uh, a tier and box gauge theoretic construction of moduli spaces of vector bundles. So um, in this situation, you take a complex vector bundle of a fixed rank and degree on uh, your, your smooth complex projective curve, and you consider the space of all holomorphic structures on, on that fixed vector bundle. And then naturally, there's an action of the, uh, what's called the complex gauge group on this space. And uh, Ethereum bot also show that you can identify the space with a space of unitary connections on E, where here you fix a Hermitian metric. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So here H is a particular emission metric that you fix. And on this side, you have uh, an action of the gauge group G uh, acting on A. Uh, so both A and C are infinite dimensional spaces. Um, but actually, um, we're going to end up with a finite dimensional quotient at the end of this. And there's two different ways that you can see this question. So um, on the uh, gauge group side here, uh, we have a moment map mu, which is basically just taking the uh, curvature of your connection. And you can construct your moduli space as either taking um, semi-stable holomorphic structures on E and quotienting out. Well, I guess actually maybe it's better to write a double slash here. So quotienting out by the uh, complex gauge group. So really, you're going to actually make some identifications here. Uh, oh, sorry, I see there's a chat. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I can make my notes available afterwards uh, as well. Um, so uh, yes, so one thing that you can do is on the um, holomorphic side, you can take semi-stable holomorphic structures on E and uh, quotient out by the complex gauge group, which is going to identify uh, S equivalent uh, structures. Or you can instead take a symplectic reduction. Oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. And so uh, I, this was already mentioned on, on Monday. So you can think of this as sort of a sort of upgrade of the Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence. And uh, as I want to talk about unstable things, um, Moreover, I'd like to say that the norm square of the moment map uh, it actually induces a more stratification of uh, the infinite uh, vector space A, and this coincides with the hardener Siemen stratification of the uh, vector space C of holomorphic structures. So let me just recall a little bit about uh, hardener Siemen filtrations. So every vector bundle has a unique hard and narrow semen filtration, which can be thought of as a maximally destabilizing filtration. So this is a filtration by subbundles such that the successive quotients, which I write by E lower I, are semi-stable and they have decreasing slopes. And this is actually a canonical filtration that you can construct. So if E is uh, already semi-stable, then it's got a trivial hard and narrow semen filtration. But if not, so then there must be some a uh, subbundle with larger slope, and then you take uh, the largest subbundle of maximal slope, and that's the first part of your hardener Siemens filtration, and then you just inductively construct it. And the hardener Siemens type of E, you can think of um, as being, we want to record the invariance of these successive quotients. So we can think of that as encoding the Hilbert polynomials of these EIs, which is equivalent to, because we're over a curve at this point, uh, just looking at the degrees and ranks of the E lower eyes. Okay, so um, that that was um, a little bit of gauge theory, and now let me uh, move to um, a more algebraic approach, as, uh, which is the reductive GIT construction of moduli space of semi-stable sheaves. And again, there are several people who have been involved in this construction. I just wrote some names. The list is certainly not exhaustive. Um, so if we uh, start off now with just, um, rather than a, a curve, a polarized projective scheme, 
and we fix the Hilbert polynomial rather than the rank and the degree, then um, it turns out that the semi-stable sheaves with this particular Hilbert polynomial are bounded. And so they can be parameterized by a quot scheme. So here what you do is um, the sum n, which is very, very large, such that all uh, such semi-stable sheaves E are n regular. So uh, it doesn't really matter what this means. Uh, uh, the most important thing is that there's two corollaries. Firstly, the evaluation map on uh, sections is surjective. And secondly, the dimension of this uh, vector space here is Pn because all the higher cohomology vanishes. And so then if you choose an isomorphism between this vector space of dimension Pn and the standard vector space, then you get a point in the quot scheme parameterizing quotients of O minus N, well, uh, Pn copies of O minus N with Hilbert polynomial P. Okay, so um, this choice that we made, uh, we have to mod out by, and so there's a natural action of the general linear group uh, on this quot scheme. And in fact, because of the diagonal uh, copy of GM, which acts trivially, uh, this leads us really to consider the action of the special linear group instead, or you could consider the uh, projective general linear group, but actually it's usually easier to work with a special linear group. And we need to linearize this action. So you linearize this action by embedding into a Grassmannian. And so this corresponds to choosing um, another natural number, which is even larger. And then you uh, embed uh, your quot scheme in a Grassmannian by basically taking your quotient to, um, so you twist by M and then take global sections. And this turns out to be surjective um, with, um, this vector space, oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do at all. Um, this vector space here has dimension PM, uh, if M is very, very large. And so then you get a, um, uh, a linearization, which I'm going to denote LM of the SLPN action on QN. And then the moduli space is constructed as the GIT quotient with respect to this linearized action. And the key point here to take away is that GIT semi-stability, which is some complicated thing involving invariance, just corresponds to sheaf semi-stability. So uh, that's the sort of ideal situation. But associated to this, there are actually two uh, stratifications that we can consider. So the first is you can look at the GIT instability stratification for this action, um, which I denote like this. And you can also look at the harden error semen stratification where you stratify your quotient sheaves by their harden error semen type. And at least given what I said before about uh, the gauge theoretic description of a tier and bot, you would expect that these should be the same. But uh, they're not exactly. And uh, the, the problem here is that um, somehow the QNs are only a finite dimensional approximation of the spaces A and C that we had before. And so this is something that I actually studied in my thesis and then uh, wrote with uh, Francis and then uh, another paper on my own. But um, uh, basically the upshot is that if you fix a hard and narrow semen type, then um, you can choose M and N very, very large. And these depend on tau, and this is very important, such that there is an unstable index um, for the stratification uh, above in one. And um, the harden error semen stratum S tau is contained inside the GIT stratum as a closed subscheme. And in fact, over a curve, uh, we really get an equality here. So the, the, the problem is if you're not over a curve, then actually there could be um, several different harden error semen types giving the same beta. But uh, that's just for a particular value of N and M. And as, as you let N and M go to infinity, um, you don't have this problem. So uh, morally, you should think of it as asymptotically the GIT stratification coincides with the hard narrow semen stratification. And there is, in fact, a way to make this precise, but I don't want to go into that now. Okay, so um, from what we said before, then we obtain a categorical quotient of the hard and narrow semen stratum, which has also this form. And what is it? Well, uh, we just first take the retraction to Z tau SS, which is taking a sheaf E to the associated graded for its hard and narrow semen filtration. 
And then you take the reductive GIT quotient of that. So actually, this is just sending a, a sheaf E with harder semen type uh, tau to uh, the point in the product of moduli spaces given by its associated gradient. So this is not an ideal uh, moduli space. But we're going to get a much better answer when we use non-reductive GIT. So let me now start with the introduction to non-reductive GIT. Um, so um, I just want to more generally talk about uh, non-reductive group actions. And the motivation here is that many moduli problems naturally involve non-reductive group actions. So for example, um, uh, you could consider moduli uh, of hypersurfaces in toric varieties. And toric varieties, so for example, weighted projective spaces, have in general non-reductive automorphism groups. So uh, you would need to quotient by a non-reductive group. And then the next example, which we've already discussed in quite a bit of depth, is moduli spaces of unstable objects, where here you see parabolic groups appearing, uh, and these are somehow associated to a flag. And then a, a third example, which I'm not going to talk about at all, is uh, moduli singularities, where um, there are certain translation actions appearing, and so you see unipotent groups. But I think uh, possibly Greg's going to talk a little bit about uh, this sort of thing in his talk. So um, I think many of you are already familiar with the key issue of uh, non-reductive GIT, which is that the uh, invariant rings may not be uh, finitely generated. And uh, the classic example was given by Nagata, which was a counterexample to Hilbert's 14th problem. So let's suppose now that G is a non-reductive group and it's acting on an affine variety. Then even if it turns out that the ring of invariance is finitely generated, we, so that we can take a, a quotient map um, uh, going from X to the spec of the ring of invariance, then this, this quotient map is very far from being a good quotient. So in fact, it might not even be subjective, which is quite uh, unusual from the point of view of GIT. And also there may not be an invariant function separating disjoint closed G invariant subsets. And actually this, this second property is very important in reductive GIT for establishing the Hilbert Mumford criterion. So I don't want to, uh, so that, that's somehow the bad news, but uh, there's been several rec recent approaches. So um, one idea is to embed G in a reductive group. And um, using this approach, there's been some progress and construction of quotients, but in general, it's still quite difficult to get a Hilbert Mumford type description of stability. And so as, as an example of this, I wanted to highlight Weizenbach's theorem, which is uh, a very classical result. So over the complex numbers, any linear GA action on an affine space extends to SL2, where you think of GA sitting inside SL2 as uh, the unipotent in the upper triangular burrell. And uh, the reason that it extends is just that you can um, take the derivation of the GA action and put it in Jordan normal form and then the blocks are basically giving you the irreducible SL2 representations. And then in this case, uh, the ring of GA invariance turns out to be finitely generated. And why is this? Well, because the GA action on V extends to SL2, we have this isomorphism here. And then you can ask, well, what is uh, SL2 uh, quotiented by GA? And that's just uh, A2 minus the origin which obviously sits inside A2 with a complement of co-dimension two. And so you can extend a function over this co-dimension two gap. And so then the, um, the ring of GA invariance, well, I guess I didn't need to put spec everywhere. Well, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean spec is finitely generated. I meant the ring of invariance is finitely generated. But uh, anyway, once, uh, 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 the upshot is that uh, the GA invariance on V are just the SL2 invariance on V cross a copy of A2. And this is now a reductive group action. And so in particular, this part here is finitely generated. Okay. And so in fact, this is a general flavor of non-reductive GIT is you somehow want to 
use some reductive group somewhere to help you out. And so um, I want to talk about non-reductive GIT for groups with graded unipotent radical. And this is um, uh, a summary of recent work of Berksy, Doran, Hawes, and Kerwin. And now we're really over the complex numbers. So um, if you take a linear algebraic group with unipotent, with unipotent radical U and a uh, reductive factor R, so we actually choose a, um, a way to write G in this form as a semi-direct product, then um, we say that the unipotent radical is graded if there's a one parameter subgroup, which is central in the uh, reductive part R, and such that this one parameter subgroup acts on the Lie algebra of U with strictly positive weights. So the key example here is actually parabolic subgroups. So if you take um, a parabolic subgroup associated to a one parameter subgroup lambda, then this turns out to be graded by that same one parameter subgroup lambda. So I've just drawn a picture in GLN. So if you take lambda to have um, weight omega one on some block of length M1, and then through to omega L on some block of length ML, and you assume that these weights are decreasing, then the, the associated parabolic subgroup looks like this. And if you look at the conjugation action of this one parameter subgroup on the unipotent part, which is in red, then you see that the weights are all positive. So they look like a WI minus WJ, where uh, I is greater than J. Or, or no, J is greater than I, I think. Anyway, which, whichever you need for them to be positive. So, um, and the theory works best in this situation because you can really use this one parameter subgroup to help construct quotients. So um, let me give the non-reductive GIT setup that we're, we're going to use. So you take G, um, a group with a unipotent radical, which is graded by some fixed one parameter subgroup. And it could be the case that actually there's several one parameter subgroups which grade, but we're just going to, assume that we've chosen one which does grade. And we assume that it's acting on a projective variety with respect to some linearization, which again, we can think of as embedding in some projective space. Then um, we define what's called U hat to be the semi-direct product of U with lambda GM. And then we define R bar to be the quotient of R by lambda GM. So I've tried to highlight what actually depends on this um, grading one parameter subgroup lambda. So um, associated to this action of uh, lambda GM on X, there's a Bionity Barula decomposition, which uh, just considers the flows of points uh, under the one parameter subgroup. And we let X min be the open stratum, which flows down to what we call Z min. And uh, so why are they called X min and Z min? Well, the reason is if you look at the, uh, the weights of the action on V, then uh, you get a weight decomposition and let's label them such that the minimum one is the first one, omega zero, and the maximum one is the last one. Then um, if you look at the minimal weight space, then that's generically what you're going to flow to. And so this uh, Z min is just, you take the projectivization of the minimal weight space and intersect with X. Okay, and so then um, we make a little technical shift, which is that we, um, so we, we twist the linearization in such a way that this shifts the lambda GM weights so that they look like the following picture here. So you have um, your minimal weight is negative and all of your other weights are positive. And the, so the reason that this is useful is that then it's very easy to describe the semi-stable set with respect to this um, GM. So in fact, semi-stability is the same as stability here. Um, because remember, uh, semi-stability is saying that the origin is contained in the convex hull of these weights. And so what that means is that you must have the weight, the minimal weight, and you must have one of the non-minimal weights. So that's this condition here. And so, um, the points which have the minimal weight are precisely uh, X min. And then the points inside X min, which only have the minimal weight is Z min. So we want to remove that. And this gives us a, a description of the semi-stable locus as follows. Okay, so 
The retraction, which is given by flowing under our one parameter subgroup lambda, is U invariant and equivariant with respect to the uh, natural map from G to its reductive part. And uh, so a little bit more notation. Um, in Zmin, we find an open set, which is the semi-stable locus for the action of R bar. So remember R bar was the quotient of R by lambda GM. And then we take its pre-image in X-min, and that's the semi-stable locus there. And then we make some uh, relatively natural assumptions, which basically um, can be thought of as asking for semi-stability to coincide with stability. So firstly, we ask that for the group, the reductive group, R bar. So we ask that for every uh, semi-stable point, the dimension of the stabilizer is zero. And so what that's saying is that actually semi-stability is the same as stability for R bar. And then we also ask the same thing for U. So we ask now for every point in X min that the dimension of the U stabilizer is zero. And actually it's equivalent to just checking on Z min, which is, which is a little bit easier. Um, uh, and you can also ask, so you can slightly modify this and ask um, what, what's called semi-stability equals Mumford stability for U hat, which if you as abelian, that's just asking that the dimension of the unipotent stabilizers is constant on X min. And uh, for U arbitrary, what you have to do is fix a normal series such that the successive quotients are abelian and then ask that the uh, dimensions of the stabilizers of each uh, subgroup in this series is constant. So then let me state the U hat theorem. Um, so if we've got G um, as above, uh, which is graded by some lambda, and we assume that L is adapted, which just means that we have these weights omega min being negative and all the others being positive, then there exists firstly a geometric U quotient of the X min locus. And then secondly, there exists a projective and geometric U hat quotient of uh, the U hat stable locus, which is actually just uh, X, oh, sorry. Which is actually just X min, and then you remove the U sweep of the Z min locus. And this, this quotient turns out to be uh, projective. And then um, you have the residual action of R bar, and you take the reductive GIT quotient of that, and this should give you a full quotient of the G action on X. And in, indeed it does. And the only difficult thing is really to work out. Uh, what the semi-stable set is, but if you assume this um, semi-stability is stability for the reductive group, then it's quite easy to describe. Namely, the, the stable set is you take the um, X min minus U Z min, and then you basically add the reductive semi-stable parts here and here. Okay, so uh, I, I wanna say a few things about the proof. So the one prime subgroup lambda is used to grade the unipotent um, and it's actually used in two ways. So in the first part, it's used to cover um, the locus X min by uh, U hat invariant open affines, each of which has a geometric quotient just given by taking the spec of the U invariant. But the quotient that we get here in stage one, this X min quotiented by U, uh, isn't necessarily projective. So in the second stage, we use the GM action to then obtain a projective quotient by U hat which is the semi-direct product of U with lambda GM. Okay, so um, the other thing is that this theorem holds um, by replacing some of these assumptions. So for example, you can replace that semi-stability is stability for the unipotent group by semi-stability is Mumford stability for the unipotent group. And if these conditions don't hold, then similar to the Kerwin desingularization, you can perform a sequence of equivarian blowups such that the, at the end of this uh, process, you end up with a variety for which these assumptions do hold. And then in this case, you can construct a quasi-projective quotient of an open subset of X as an open subset of um, the uh, G quotient of X tilde. And if you further twist the linearization by a character, um, so in, in the terminology of um, uh, Berksy, Duran, Hawes, and Kerwin, uh, you make L well adapted, which means that really you take your minimal weight very close to zero. 
then the ring of invariant sections is finitely generated uh, and the above questions arise just from taking prod of these invariants. So it's uh, a very similar description to reductive GIT uh, in the sense that we have a, a projective quotient and we have a nice description of the stable locus. Okay, so I wanted to give a couple of examples. So let me briefly mention some work of uh, my PhD student who finished his thesis last year on modulized spaces of hypersurfaces and weighted projective spaces. So um, if you recall, um, Mumford studied modulized spaces of degree D hypersurfaces in PN using reductive GIT. So here you look at the natural PGLN action, oh, sorry, PGLN plus one action on uh, the space of degree D hypersurfaces in PN. And um, at least uh, if you rule out some low values of D, then smooth hypersurfaces are GIT stable. And so uh, my PhD student, Dominic Bunnett, studied the same thing for weighted projective spaces. So now instead we've got a Cox ring, which is um, graded by weighted degree. And uh, now we have, instead of PGLN, we have the automorphism group of our weighted projective space acting on the degree D hypersurfaces. And this is non-reductive. So um, I've given an example here. So if you look at automorphisms of uh, P112, then um, from these, oh, that's not what I want to do. From these two weights here, you get a copy of GL2. And then from the two here, you get a copy of GL. And then you also get a unipotent factor, which is um, given by sending the last coordinate Z to a Z plus AX squared plus BXY plus CY squared, where A, B, and C are in uh, the additive group GA. And then you quotient by the diagonal GM, a bit like how you get PGLM uh, for PN. And uh, so Dominic proves that um, if we take D to be uh, greater than or equal to the maximum of the AIs plus two, then any degree D quasi smooth hypersurface has finite automorphism group. And so uh, this means that the stabilizer group here is finite. Uh, and if we assume that uh, the unipotent stabilizers, the unipotent stabilizers are finite dimensional, then any degree D quasi-smooth quasi hypersurface is stable. And so then it just boils down to when does this actually hold? So um, if you look at uh, P111R and you take D to be a multiple of R, then this condition does hold. And so there is a quasi-projective modulized space for degree D quasi-smooth hypersurfaces in uh, P111R. Okay. So uh, in the remaining time, I want to talk about, uh, uh, I want to get back to quotients of unstable strata by non-reductive GIT. So here we, um, we started off with georeductive group acting on a projective variety. And then we took a, an instability stratification uh, associated to some norm. And we're looking at one of the unstable stratum and asking how to construct a quotient of that. And the idea is that we're going to apply the U-hat theorem to the parabolic group acting on, so, well, in fact, we can take the closure of Y beta to get a projective variety. And we uh, take a twisted linearization um, where we basically shift in the direction of beta and just shift a little bit beyond beta. So I, I'll, I'll explain with some pictures very soon. So then in this case, the X min, appearing in non-reductive GIT is the Y beta and the Z min appearing in non-reductive GIT is the Z beta and uh, cor the corresponding semi-stable loci also agree. So I just wanted to quickly draw a proof uh, of the first part. So for this, you consider the T weights um, picture that we had before and we want to look at the weights of lambda beta. So to do this, you just project all of the weights onto this ray, um, uh, which I tried to draw. And then you shift the linearization uh, by minus one plus epsilon beta, which basically then makes this well adapted. So you have that your minimal weight uh, is negative and all of your other weights are positive. Then um, the Z min locus is just precisely uh, those points which have minimal weight. So it's the ones on this hypersurface and that was precisely what Z beta was. 
And then y beta is the ones that flow down to that. And uh, that's also x min. OK. Then we obtain the following corollary of the u hat theorem. Um, so for this action, if we suppose that these two conditions hold, um, then there's a projective geometric p beta quotient, and the stable locus is just y beta ss. And we remove this bad locus that was causing us all the problems before. Um, well, actually, we remove its u sweep um, to make it a p beta invariant sub variety that we're removing. And we end up with a projective uh, quotient at the end. So this was under these two assumptions. And so the natural question is when do these two assumptions hold? So let's return to the example of sheaves of fixed hard and type. Then um, if we again choose M and N very large, such that the hard and Siemens stratum is contained inside some GIT stratum, um, and we can choose a representative such that a para parabolic subgroup looks like this, then here the L tau um, looks like a product of general linear groups intersected with the big um, SL. And it has center um, given by, so each of these has center GM and then you're intersecting with the SL, so you get a GM uh, L minus one copies of GM as the center. And the problem here is that actually the center is acting trivially on Z tau, which Z tau in this case is just a product of uh, quad schemes uh, for the basically one for each of the successive quotients in the hard and narrow semen uh, stratification in, in the hard and narrow semen filtration. But the, the, the problem here is that the center is not acting trivially on y tau. And so if L is greater than two, we see that um, even when we mod out by the um, grading one parameter subgroup, then we still have a global stabilizer acting on z tau. And so we see that this, um, this R bar condition does not hold. So we don't have semi-stability uh, being the same as stability for the L tau bar action on Z tau. And so this is kind of disappointing because we'd like to construct projective quotients. Um, and uh, so we could do the blow up procedure, but then you end up only with a quasi-projective quotient. And so in fact, we've taken a, a different point of view which is that we quotient in stages. And so here, so now we just assume that G is SLN, just to make our life a little bit easier. And we've got some unstable stratum as above. Uh, and um, we fix lambda beta so that P beta looks like a block upper triangular matrix. Um, and the L beta is a, a block diagonal matrix. And let L be the number of blocks. So if we were looking at sheaves of a particular hard and Siemens type, L would be telling us the length of the hard and Siemens filtration. And then the idea uh, is basically to construct a P beta quotient of um, the closure of Y beta in uh, stages by filtering along the block rows of U. So at each stage, um, the unipotent group that we are quotienting by uh, turns out to be abelian. And at each stage, we use a different one parameter subgroup in this center to grade. And so in this way, we actually kill the center because uh, uh, we're using it to grade. So the two advantages here are that firstly, because we're only looking at abelian unipotent groups, it's easier to describe the uh, semi-stability equals stability condition on unipotent stabilizers. And secondly, um, we now only need to ask for semi-stability to be equal to stability for L beta quotiented by its center. And this is very helpful when the center acts trivially like we had for sheaves. So um, let me see. So I want to explain what the result is for sheaves and then explain how the construction works if I've got time. So um, if we look at moduli spaces of unstable sheaves, um, then we can construct moduli spaces um, via this quotienting in stages procedure. So here we fix a hard and Siemens type tau. Um, and for simplicity, I'm going to assume that tau is co-prime, which means that we have semi-stability equals stability for each um, Hilbert polynomial appearing in this um, tuple. So I, I will say something about what happens if, if tau is not co-prime afterwards. So then in this case, reductive semi-stability equals stability at each stage holds automatically because you're basically looking at the um, 
SLPI and action on some quot scheme. And uh, because of the co-prime assumption, we automatically get this condition. Uh, then the other conditions that we have to look at is the graded unipotent uh, stabilizers um, being constant dimensional. And actually we can reinterpret this in terms of uh, sheaf theoretic language as uh, saying that you need um, the dimensions of certain home groups to be constant. And so I'm going to call this condition star. Um, and we're going to assume, first of all, that this does hold. Then, um, and, and, and in a sense, it's a bit like some sort of real nurse type condition you're asking here. Then um, finally, uh, we also have to think about what happens with graded unipotent stability. So if you remember, you remove basically the UZ min locus at each stage. And what that does is actually it removes the locus where EI inside EI plus one is split. And therefore we need to require that um, each inclusion in the hardened error semen filtration is non-split. And so uh, we refer to this as E being completely non-HN split. Then, um, so uh, this is work in progress um, and we're currently writing up the results. So I put it as a theorem in inverted commas, but for a co-prime hardened error semen type, satisfying star, there is a projective moduli state space of completely non-hardened error semen split sheaves of hardened error semen type tau. Okay, and but I, I, I think that this, uh, result will hopefully uh, be available early in 2021. And let me make a few quick remarks. So when uh, this condition star on the stabilizers um, or the dimensions of these home groups doesn't hold, then you should be um, actually able to obtain a quasi-projective moduli space using blow-ups. And if tau is not co-prime, then um, all you have to do is restrict to sheaves such that the hardened error semen subquotients EI are stable for all i. And then you get a quasi-projective moduli space for those. But the ideal situation is when you actually end up with a projective moduli space. Okay, and uh, so I don't really have much time. So maybe I just, uh, uh, what time did I start? Am I? You started at uh, five past, uh, at five past one, but um, you, can, you can have another five. Uh, a bit more. Yeah, maybe, well, no, maybe like, just maybe just two or three minutes. I would, I would just want to say yeah. uh, that the proof um, basically involves this quotienting in stages construction, and I wanted to just give a few details on this. So, um, if we have an unstable stratum again, so we've got a parabolic group acting on uh, y beta bar, which I'm just going to call x beta to simplify the notation, and we chose uh, choose some one parameter subgroup. Um, lambda beta such that um, all of the weights are strictly decreasing. So we've got um, weight beta one on some block of length M1 and then beta two on some block of length M2 all the way up to beta L um, uh, on a block of length ML. So then P beta is block up have triangular with L blocks. And as we said before, the center looks like um, GM L minus one. So here again, we're in the SL case. And the idea is basically to filter P, beta, and U using the rows in this block form. So um, the first step we just look at um, where, so we allow non-zero entries on the top row. And then in the second step, we allow non-zero entries on the top two rows and so on until we filter the whole of U. And you get corresponding filtrations for L, beta, R, and P, beta. And uh, we use these filtrations to inductively construct a um, quotient, where at each stage we use a different one parameter subgroup to grade. Um, and so I, I've written down what the one parameter subgroup is, but basically uh, the idea is that at each stage you have a one parameter subgroup which um, takes the first i blocks and basically merges the weights, and then takes the remaining blocks and again merges the weights. So you have just two blocks. And um, if you look at its image in the quotient group, then this actually grades the um, su successive quotients of the unipotent groups here. And then uh, basically the idea is that we construct um, quotients inductively. So um, at the first stage, we start off with X beta and we have um, H1 hat, which is you take uh, U, U1 semi-direct product with R1 and you grade by uh, lambda one. And 
uh, you then apply the U hat theorem and get a H1 hat quotient of it, and then H2 hat acts on that. And you take the H2 hat quotient and you keep on going until you eventually get down to X beta L. So um, there's only L minus one quotient that you need to do. And uh, if at each stage you can apply the U hat theorem, then we get um, the following diagram. And at each stage, the stable locus is explicit. And so consequently, we obtain a um, geometric uh, P beta quotient of an open subset, basically given by the pre-image of uh, this under this whole composition here, um, which is actually a projective variety at the end. And so it just remains to describe this pre-image. And actually that's possible, but very complicated, but I described how it looks for unstable sheaves above. So, okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. So would anyone have any questions for Victoria? Uh, I have a question, but uh, Chen Yang wrote one on the chat, so I'm yeah. ask this and then ask mine. So Chen Yang writes, there is a general theory of good nullify space by Jared Alper, which is an abstract version for reductive GIT quotient. Is there a similar abstract theory for non-reductive case possible? So that's a very good question. So certainly the, the good moduli space is really adapted to reductive GIT in the sense that if you look at the classifying stack BG, um, then it's going to have a good moduli space if and only if G is uh, linearly reductive. And so certainly the, the theory developed by Jared Alper and co uh, doesn't work in the non-reductive setting, but it's actually something that um, together with Francis Cohen and David Ridd, we've been thinking about a little bit. And so there should be some uh, new definition of uh, 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 moduli spaces, uh, which is somehow amenable to the non-reductive GIT setup. Um, if there are no more questions, I want to ask one about the work by your PhD student. Oh, yeah. Um, weighted hypersurfaces. Sure, shall I scroll yeah, up? Yeah, maybe. So maybe. I, yeah, I have to find it. But, uh, so I have to remember yeah. it. The, the, the theorem, maybe? Or I, I yeah, know. I think the theorem is good. So, in the study I explained before, uh, it gave to me the impression that. Um, that in a way you have to make a choice at some point, not only on how you embed the, the reductive group, but also on choosing these one parameter subgroups. Exactly. Uh, but uh, here in the theorem, it seems like there's no choice. Everything is- Well, there's somehow a canonical choice of a grading that you can make. Um, and so there's, there's sort of a one very natural choice. And so he makes that choice. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, but it, it's true that actually, so, in some sense, the choice of this lambda uh, can be thought of as a, a little bit like the choice of the linearization as well. I mean, it's somehow some extra data that you have to choose and the quotient that you get relies on this choice. So I tried to make this clear in when I stated the U hat theorem that um, uh, everything in pink depends on the lambda. So the X mins depend on uh, the lambda and the Z mins depend on the lambda. and so you really see that actually the whole quotient that you get really depends on this particular and, choice. And the quotient by automorphism group in the example of P112 that you give, you give that as composition in the, in the reductive and the unipotent part. Yes. Uh, can the quotient be understood as quotienting by one and then by the other one? Uh, well, yes, that's essentially what you do. So you quotient first by the reductive part and then by the uh, grading group and then you quotient by the sorry you quotient by the unipotent part and then you quotient by the grading group and then by the reductive part that's remaining uh -huh, okay. and so that, that that's basically the the, the construction uh -huh. okay thank you there is another question in the chat by Florent Schaffhauser who asks whether there's a symplectic Kempfness approach to the non-reductive GIT quotients you described Yes, so there is, um, but I think, uh, so I'm not sure if um, Eloise or Greg is going to be discussing this. Let's, uh, I, will, I will discuss it a little bit, yeah. Okay, so maybe- There, I, is, a, there is a moment, there's a symplectic uh, side of the story. Yeah, so maybe so then I don't have to write anything. I can just refer to 
uh, Greg's talk later, but uh, there is, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, there, there is basically a symplectic approach. Uh, and this is very useful for when you want to construct, well, when you want to sort of study Betty numbers and so on, uh, which Eloise is going to talk about. So I don't want to step on people's talks, so I won't say too much. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other question? Yes, uh, I have another question. Uh, could you briefly mention where you get the projectivity of uh, of this uh, model of, of this non-reductive quotient? Yeah. So um, let's go back to the theorem. So uh, as I said, when you have this x min uh, quotient by u, uh, this thing here. Um, it, it's not projective, but what you actually do is you use the GM action to um, define an embedding of this into some projective variety in such a way that once you take the GM quotient of that, you get a closed sub variety. And so you get something that's projective. It's, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but really in the second step here, you actually use this, um, this grading one parameter subgroup in quite a crucial way. I see. Does anyone else have any questions? If not, let's thank Vicky again. Thank you. And, um, and we'll start again. The next talk is in a few minutes. Um, so I suggest uh, if that's okay with Eloise to perhaps push back the start to 2.20, so in 10 minutes. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Fantastic.